I'm Nelson Davis, executive producer of Making It. When you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? Maybe it is what you became. Maybe you don't remember. Or perhaps it's still there, deep inside, waiting for the key to unlock it. Something, somewhere, someone that will connect you with a long-ago imagined destiny. For Iris Rideau, it was an old farmhouse on a plot of land she was selling to fund her retirement. But one look at that old adobe building changed her life and redirected her future. It is the transformation of Iris that we'll explore next on Making It. Making It, featuring inspiring personal stories of struggle, triumph, and success from America's small business communities. Welcome to Making It. I'm Lynette Romero. And I'm Emmett Miller. Thanks for joining us for our very special 500th episode of Making It. Very important milestone indeed. Well, the seed of the story we are about to tell you was planted more than a half century ago in the city of New Orleans. There, a young Creole girl named Iris used to join her grandmother for dinner. This genteel woman taught her French table manners and the art of appreciating fine wine. Iris's parents were divorced and she yearned to see her father in California. So as soon as she was old enough, she hopped a train for the journey out west. She spent many happy summers working alongside him as a ranch hand. She'd fallen in love with California and convinced her mother to move there. But it was far from the idyllic life she had imagined. Her mother worked grueling hours at a sewing factory. And when Iris became a teenage mother, she was forced to work there as well. But Iris was determined to take charge of her own future. She took college courses at night that helped her land a job at an insurance company. Next followed a very important step in her business life, the formation of her very own insurance agency. And this is where we first met Iris when Making It interviewed her 16 years ago. But as her retirement drew near, something happened. Destiny led her in another direction, one which would intersect with all of her childhood experiences, fine wines, entertaining, and farming. This is um, everything that I've ever wanted to do in life. I love being in business. I'm an entrepreneur in my soul. It is my passion. It's my lifestyle. I love entertaining. I love cooking. I love pairing the wines with food. I love music. So what better way to live life than fine food, great wine, good friends, good music, beautiful home. I've done it all, and I'm totally done. I'm going to sit back now and catch my breath and enjoy my life. For Iris Rideau, the 25-acre Rideau California winery is the third act in a play that has spanned six decades and three successful business enterprises. But it would take her former husband, fellow New Orleans native Jimmy Rideau, to ignite the entrepreneurial spirit in her. When we married, um, I was 19, he was 21, and we started our a real estate business together. And this was in the 50s. And um, this w it was pretty unusual to have such a young couple starting a business in those days. But he taught me all of the ins and outs of how to make a business work. Rideau first appeared on Making It in 1989 as the owner of IC Rideau Securities, an enterprise that specialized in insurance policies, pensions, and investment banking. As part of her five-year retirement plan, she purchased some acreage in the San Inez Valley, north of Los Angeles. But as time went on, and the closer it got to the end of my five years, I realized that I could not be in the country here with nothing to do. And the thought of just playing golf with my mom for the rest of my life was not the most desirable thing. Iris reverted back to her roots, entrepreneurship. And as I looked around the valley, um, there's only two things that you can do in the valley to make money at, and that is to be a winemaker or to raise horses, and I was not into riding horses and certainly into drinking wine. She didn't arrive at the decision to start a winery right away. She originally purchased the property with the idea of restoring it and selling it for a profit. But something remarkable happened. I just fell in love with this beautiful old home, and as I started to restore it, I discovered all these beautiful old uh, original floors and ceilings and uh, it began to look like my grandfather's house that we grew up in in New Orleans. And so I said, I just fell in love with it, and I said, I've got to keep it. 
Her first idea was to open it as an inn or a restaurant, but the county of Santa Barbara said no to both of those ideas. And then she discovered an ordinance that said if she grew grapes and made wine, she could sell the wine in her tasting room. Along came this great winemaker that was leaving a very famous winery, and he was looking for a place to make his own wine. Uh, we were introduced through my land use consultant, and um, I said, okay, let's go. He says, you need a winemaker? I said, yes. And I said, if you uh, make the wine for me, I will build the winery for both of us. Yet building a winery is not a simple undertaking. I planted the vineyard in 1998. It takes three years before you get your first fruit. They call it the third leaf. And, um, but during those three years, your plant is growing. You have to prune it back each fall and allow it to grow again. And um, by the third year, you've got little clusters of fruit. Not much, and most of which you throw away that third year. So you pretty much have to wait until the fourth year before you can use the, the fruit from your vineyard. It also takes a tremendous amount of financial investment. To date, Rideau has poured well over $2 million into her winery. According to Iris, she raised the money from her investments and retirement savings. However, as I got into this business, I began to realize that it wasn't quite enough just on what I had in my savings and what I'd raised. So I did borrow from my savings account, from my retirement account, to invest in this business. Um, but I've done it all on my own. I have no investors, no partners, no one other than myself and the bank. But the joys of self-determination can quickly become a sobering reality when things turn sour. <sighs> I have to take a deep breath on that because the lowest point in my uh, winemaking career came um, three years ago um, where I lost half of my wine. And I'm talking about um, wines that were in barrels in the winery. Um, I lost 15,000 gallons of wine to contamination because I had a winemaker that was not paying attention to what was going on in the winery. With millions invested and half of her wine ruined, Iris contemplated cutting her losses and throwing in the towel. It was a costly lesson, one that she would never forget. This is mesmerizing. We're it all just really you know, mesmerized What's by this. What's gonna happen next? Absolutely, in part two of Making It, we'll see what Iris did to come back from the brink of financial ruin. In Secrets of Success, the Reverend Mark Whitlock tells us how to navigate our way through obstacles on the road to success. Just follow these five steps. You know, have you ever failed at anything? I'm Mark Whitlock. You know what? If you failed at something, then a setback is a setup for a comeback. When you fail, do five things. One, take a look at the details on what went wrong. Two, talk to the market conditions. Three, talk to an expert to find out their advice and what they're doing. Four, make sure you know the business process that you adhere to is in place. Finally, don't blame anybody but yourself. You know what? When you find yourself in a depressed place, find a way to just pick yourself up. Stay depressed for maybe a day, but the next day, get up off your rusty dusty and start a new project, start a new business, start a new attitude. With that in mind, we know that a setback is a setup for a comeback. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning time. I'm Mark Whitlock with Making It. The Reverend Mark Whitlock is the president of Nehemiah Corporation. You can contact him by emailing him at markw at corechurch.org. And for more secrets of success, log on to our website at makingittv.com. Up next, from insurance broker to winery owner, we'll continue the story of how Iris Rideau transformed herself. Did she succeed or was her experience sour grapes? Don't go away. Where small business is the big idea, making it is being brought to you by The Boeing Company, by Southern California Edison, for over 100 years, life powered by Edison, and by Bank of America, higher standards. Welcome back to Making It. 
Business analysts predicted a bumper harvest of California wine grapes in 2005, nearly 3 million tons. Experts say that crop was worth more than $1.8 billion, and that is music to the ears of vineyard owner Iris Rideau. In the first part of our story, we saw how Iris abandoned her plans for a comfortable retirement and rediscovered her passions of childhood as a vineyard owner and how the carelessness of her winemaker caused her the disastrous loss of half her wine inventory. When we left off, Iris was considering shelving the whole venture, but instead she mustered her inner strength and came back stronger than ever, which was fortunate because Mother Nature had yet more troubles in store for her. I think every situation that you have in life, there's a reason for it, and there's, there's a lesson to be learned. And if you can look at what that lesson is, as opposed to blaming somebody or beco becoming discouraged or feeling overwhelmed by it, and you might feel overwhelmed by it for a while, but you have to get the lesson. You really do, because that's life. It is that unyielding spirit that led Rideau to dig deep and find a way for her fledgling winery to survive. I had to literally rent tanker trucks. You know the tanker trucks that carry the gasoline in that you see up and down the highway? I had five of those that were needed to take out bad wine. It took two years for Iris to replace all of the bad wine, but her experience as an insurance broker helped her to recoup some of the losses. She cut back production and raised her prices. Iris had bounced back. I always say that you, God is so in the plan that he makes it much better and much greater than you could ever dream of or plan for or fight for or struggle for, you know. Today, the Rideau Winery produces 11 different wine varietals. We specialize in Rhone varietals because that's what my vineyard is planted to. We have Viognier, Roussan, um, Mouvedre, Grenache, and Syrah. And Iris can't wait to share the fruits of her labor with visitors to her tasting room, where they'll receive the ultimate New Orleans experience. We drape everybody with Mardi Gras beads, and then they're in this festive party mood. And once they start tasting these premium wines, I mean, it's just no stopping them. And everybody's having a great time. But Rideau doesn't stop there. From the beginning, she built on her hometown theme by cooking homemade dishes like red beans and rice and jambalaya. I cooked every weekend when I first opened my doors so that people, when they walked through the living room, they come straight to the kitchen and I was always pairing something that I was cooking with a bottle of wine. Now the crowds are so big that she has to hire a chef to cook for customers. However, it's not all fine wines and good times. After all, Iris is still a farmer and subject to many of the same environmental hazards. But um, farming is difficult because you're depending on Mother Nature. Example, last year we had an early fruit set and a hot wind came through and burned all of the little clusters. So I got about 10% of my harvest last year of the Viognier because of the shatter. With 90% of her harvest gone in 2004, Rideau was dealt another major setback, but she got through. She purchased grapes from other vineyards to replace her inventory. This year, 2005, our sales are at 1.7 million. And so we're projecting to finish out at 2.5 million at the end of the year. Not bad for a winery that sells wholly through its tasting room and its wine club. Iris says she's constantly working to improve her wines, along with her new winemaker, Andy Ibarra. A very accomplished winemaker, probably the most accomplished winemaker I've ever had, certainly, and the most accomplished I've ever known. And I'm not just saying that because he's my winemaker. With all of her success, Rideau feels fortunate that she's in a position to help out her family members in her hometown of New Orleans and the other victims of 2005's Hurricane Katrina. They need everything. So I put the word out through my cellar club, through my tasting room, and we have a truck that's great. <sighs> I have a truck that's going down this Friday with food and furniture and clothing, and I'm sending money already to them in hopes that they can find a place. I have some, my, another auntie of mine and her daughters are staying at the Holiday Inn. They don't even have a place. 
They don't even have an apartment. They don't know where they're going to go. Though they choose to stay together to support each other, Rideau's family members know that there's always a place for them in San Inez. I think that the ultimate legacy that I will leave now is for my family, for my children, for my grandchildren, and for my great-grandchildren. And I now have created a place where all of my family come. Full of many peaks and valleys, hers is a legacy that extends to her family, to women, and far beyond. Certainly I'm the only African-American woman in the industry, but I don't know of any other woman that is making wine to the level that I'm making it. There are a lot of women that are winemakers. There are some that own vineyards. But to own the vineyard, make the wine, have the tasting room, have a production facility, have 13 people on staff full time, uh, I don't believe that there are any other women in the country doing what I'm doing. I haven't found her yet anyway. What an amazing spirit. She's and she thought she was going to play else, golf. Isn't she? Yeah. And relax. Well, guess what? She's doing a whole lot more than that. Her destiny. You know, Iris now takes a hands on approach when it comes to managing her winery. She tastes the wines every day, checks all the barrels every few days, and spends at least a day in the vineyards every week. She says she plans to cap production at 15,000 cases a year in order to ensure that quality remains high. Coming up next, we'll tell you how to contact Iris Rideau. And our studio guest is Coot Blackson. He'll tell you, take you through the steps that you can take to transform your passions into a thriving business. Don't go away. Okay, here's how you can get in touch with the entrepreneur you've met on today's show. You can contact Iris Rideau at Rideau Vineyard by calling 805-688-0717 or log on to her website at RideauVineyard.com. And now here's Lynette with today's studio guest, Coot Blackson. Thanks, Emmett. Coot Blackson is the president of the Blackson Group. He's nationally known as a transformation coach and inspirational speaker. Welcome to Making It. We it's appreciate great to be you here. really being here. I'm ready to be inspired. All right. Okay. I'm to be here. Let's do it. Let's talk about today's show. We saw how everything that entrepreneur Iris Rideau has done throughout her life really prepared her for her ideal business. Yes. Can you talk about that? Good, bad, ugly. All those experiences are yeah, important. You know, I feel that every single thing that happens to us really is a gift. Inherent in every experience, relationship, job is a gift. Our role is to really find out what that gift is because it really prepares our character and is the building block that develops us to have us ready for our true vision for what we're really here to do. The only thing is, in those moments, we don't often see it. Right. So this is what I say, trust the process of life. Life's been around a lot longer than us. Number two, be in the moment. Trust the moment because it's the things that we do now, giving 100% to the moment while knowing our vision. Mm -hmm. It's the things we do now that really make the difference to move us forward. Destiny, a lot of people believe in destiny. Yes. How does an entrepreneur find their true destiny? To me, encoded in our DNA, in our very hearts, is that destiny. Our role is to simply be receptive to it. So I tell an entrepreneur to take time to listen. We often don't listen to our hearts. We often don't listen to that impulse of life that's actually there. So the first step is take time in the stillness to listen. Number two, create the vision, create the plan, acknowledge that vision that's seeking to come through. Number three, build a team. Really build a transformational team of people that are gonna support you in living your full potential. Take action. The rest is, to me, enjoy the process. Well, you really have to take a breath because you get caught up in the day-to-day. Yeah. -day. yeah, and to me, that's often why so many people, 65% of people in America are, are depressed. Right. It's often because we're not living what's seeking to come through, our right. true gifts. Let's talk about a transformation coach. What does that mean, transformation? Transformation. What I do as a transformational coach is I don't really coach people. I don't really teach people. I don't really train people. What I do is I untrain people. I uncoach people. As kids, we're free. We're in touch with our dreams. Yet as we go through life, stuff happens, relationships, experiences. We start to shut down and lose touch with that dream. Mm -hmm. As a transformational coach, I help people peel away the layers that block the free expression of their true gifts, of their true essence, of their authentic selves. And I really help people live that fully. It's an uncoaching. Well, let's talk about those things that block us. What yes. are the things, what are the hurdles that keep us from transformation? There are a lot, but what I found is a theme. The simplest thing, and we'll keep it simple, we're often not honest with ourselves. We say we want to transform. Mm -hmm. We say we want to lose weight. We say we want to start that business, but we're more committed to security. 
we're more committed to staying where we are. Maybe we're afraid unconsciously that if we really succeed, we won't be liked. Right. We will lose acceptance. So the first key, be honest with your current reality. Because when you're honest with, if it's, I'm afraid, then you can actually deal with it. One of the things I found that distinguish successful entrepreneurs is they embrace the unknown. And change, right? And change. change they embrace it. They make it their friend. They, they love it because <laughs> it's in the unknown that new possibility lies. Scary. <laughs> but exciting. But exciting. If you're an entrepreneur and you're not scared right. half the time, you're doing something right. wrong. Right, that, that energy. Okay, let's talk about a really specific exercise. Give us an exercise that we can take to set us on track for entrepreneurship. Okay, this is what I'd tell the viewers to do. You can do it along with us. Okay. I would say imagine that today is the last day of your entire life. Just imagine that, feel like this is it today and the angel of death has knocked on your door and says, you're going today. Feel, and I'd have the viewers feel, what's ungiven? What am I holding back? Right. What is it that I must do to be completely fulfilled and happy so that if death did come today, I could throw my arms up and say I'm ready to go? So I'd say, feel, what, what is my deepest gift? And how would I need to restructure, rearrange my entire life so that if today was the day, I could go with a smile because then you're truly living. Right, so you have to do that in business and in life both. to really be fulfilled. Completely. They're both connected. Life and business is completely connected. Can you talk real quickly yes. about um, the ego-driven ego paradigm and how things are changing from the outside versus working from the inside? How does that work? I feel like we're in, in a new era where it's no longer enough just to make money. I have a lot of clients who are very successful, made millions of dollars, but they come to me because they're dying inside. Their spirits, their souls, they're dying. They're not in touch with their purpose. That is the ego-driven paradigm, where it's often about simply, simply getting what I think I want, based on who I think I am or based on who I think I should be by society standards. And I tell my, my clients that you might get everything you think you want, the car, the house, the money, and all of that, and it's great, but at some point, a life of just getting right. leads to dissatisfaction. So to me, the new paradigm is really getting in touch with your gifts and giving what you are, and you can give it right now. It works. I'm inspired. All right. I'm inspired. Good to be here. <laughs> Thank you so Thanks much. We really me. appreciate it. Uh, we will tell you how you can get in touch with Coop Blackson right after this break, so don't go away. Celebrating the small business community, making it is being brought to you by Comerica Bank. We listen, we understand, we make it work. Sempra Energy, a Fortune 500 energy services company committed to building a diverse supplier base. And by Honda, the power of dreams. You can reach Coot Blackson at the Blackson Group by calling 818-990-0231. And if you'd like to get a copy of today's show or find other small business resources, just log on to our website at makingittv.com. And that's our show for this week. I'm Emmett Miller. And I'm Lynette Romero. Thanks for joining us. This was our 500th show. We have celebrated 1,000 entrepreneurs, and we'll see you next time right here on Making It. You know, I believe that. It's impossible to do anything without giving God credit for it. I could not have done any of what I did by myself. Although I always say that the property looked like hell when he had it by himself. <laughs>
and welcome to Making It. I'm Lynette Romero. And I'm Evan Miller. Thanks for joining us. Some of the most successful entrepreneurs of our time recognized opportunity and a sea of obstacles. Consider Howard Schultz, the man who took a little Seattle coffee house and turned it into Starbucks. Remember him? Or maybe even Robert Johnson, who saw a chance to create TV programming for African Americans with black entertainment television. And now we can add another name to that list, Carmen Murray. Well, many people would consider Carmen an unlikely entrepreneur. She grew up in a poor neighborhood in Mexico, living in a tiny house with dirt floors. Well, turning obstacle into opportunity was necessary just to survive. Little did Carmen know that life's hard lessons would teach her many of the things she'd need to be successful in business. Ironic as well, Annette, that Carmen grew up without any flooring herself and then ended up working in a place where she was surrounded by luxury rugs and carpets. So she started working as a receptionist at Rodeo Carpet Mills. Her boss so admired her work ethic and her honesty, she was soon given a promotion and then another and then another. Carmen slowly moved through the ranks, taking advantage of every opportunity she was given to develop skills and improve the company. And then one day, she had the chance to buy the controlling interest in the business. Well, many people might have passed on that offer, only seeing the responsibility and the hard work that comes with taking over a company. But not Carmen. She says the rewards of ownership are worth all of those struggles. I had a goal that by the time I was 40, I was going to be well off. And I didn't know what well off meant, but that was a goal for me. It was a goal that seemed far-fetched. After all, Carmen Murray was working as a part-time receptionist with only a high school education. She came to the United States from Mexico when she was 10 years old. She remembers how poor her family was and how they struggled. I don't think that anyone can imagine how I grew up or where I lived. No flooring, um, uh, basically just dirt flooring. Um, no indoor plumbing, so if you had to shower up or go to the restroom, you had to go out into a do um, an outhouse. With little money in the family, Carmen had no choice but to work. She started at age six. My sister and I, Lenore, um, my mother used to make burritos, and she would send us out in the street to sell them. And so we sold burritos on the street after school every day. After such a difficult childhood, Carmen was relieved when she got married years later. She thought life was supposed to be easier from here on out while working at a carpet factory. I thought, okay, great, my husband's going to support me and I don't have to work anymore. I had been working for a long time since I was like six years old. So I figured I would look for part-time work, which I did. I found it here. I, I started working as a part-time receptionist. When I was a part-time receptionist, it was just a job. It was just something that uh, was helping support um, the household. And I, I didn't know anything about the carpet business. All I knew is you install it fuzzy side up, and that's all I knew. Though she only had a low-level job, Carmen worked hard and diligently. Her boss, Lou Sugarman, took notice. He said to me uh, plenty of times, he said, Honey, I would trust you in a room full of uncounted money. And I, that meant a lot to me. And little things like that that he would say would just motivate me even more. So motivated was Carmen, Blue Sugarman promoted her to general manager. He also gave her the option to buy stock in the company. I don't know how he decided to give me the opportunity to purchase stock from him. Why me? I always ask myself, why me? And the only thing I can come up with is he felt that I took care of his company. But her rise to management and subsequent ownership did not sit well with some of her one-time colleagues. After all, they were the ones that had taught her everything she knew. I did find some resistance, which is pretty normal. Um, you know, a, a female Hispanic, I think is pretty normal, um, that rose above everybody else that had already been here. They wanted to keep going the way it was. And I, I knew that we had to change. And so I, I kept at it, I kept insisting, and I, I, I did a lot of politically correct, even though it was very frustrating to, to deal with that. I felt that I couldn't force it. I had to work with them. Then, just as her employees were coming around, a bad economy hit, and then September 11th. Carmen's $5 million business was cut to less than half, forcing her to lay off 50% of her employees. It was very hard. It was the hardest part of, of, of my life that I had to go through. I had to put it off for a month, and I couldn't sleep at night. I was getting maybe 30 minutes sleep at night, and that was very hard. I lost 10 pounds within, within two weeks. Couldn't sleep. I looked terrible, 
and um, but I, that was something I had to do. With little money coming in, Carmen took the unusual step of spending money and still going out. She just did it on a budget. Instead of getting on a plane two weeks from now and paying $600 for a ticket, I, I planned 21 days in advance and travel southwest for $29 a, a ticket. Uh, so I really planned and I kept going out and I kept doing my homework and I kept, um, I kept marketing the product. After years of downtime, Carmen's strategy paid off. Today, Rodeo Carpet Mills is a bustling business. Okay, so this particular carpet here, this is for um, the sheen resident. And we need to make sure that we ship it before Christmas. From the homes of celebrities like Charlie Sheen to the floors of corporate aircraft, Rodeo Carpet Mills caters to a niche of mostly high-end clients. Many of the carpets are handcrafted and can run up to $1 million. Business is so good, Carmen says the company might rebound to its $5 million level. We expect to get back to normal by the end of this calendar year. Even though business is good, Carmen says she's learned a valuable lesson from when things weren't so great. Plan ahead and save a lot of money <laughs> for rainy days. And despite her ups, despite her downs, despite even her poor childhood back in Mexico, Carmen says she's now reached her goal and she wouldn't change a thing. If I go back and see myself where I come from and how I lived, I am more than well off. I have exceeded, in my definition, well off. You know, it's inter interesting. She said she kept thinking to herself, why me? You know, why not her? That's, why, she, that's you know, very you true. You have to think, why not that's me? That's very true. Well, despite the return to a $5 million gross, Carmen knows sales can dip always once again. But she says one reason for her continued success at the helm is she always has a plan and she continues to work hard. So do you have what it takes to run a business like Carmen? You can know in minutes by answering some essential questions. Business author Harold LaFall explains in today's Secrets of Success. Unsure whether or not you have what it takes to become a CEO of your own business? Here are 10 key questions to ask yourself. Number one, are you a self-starter? Number two, do you have good people skills? Number three, can you take charge of a project and see it through to completion? Number four, can you make sound decisions quickly? Number five, is your health good? Number six, are you trustworthy? Number seven, are you good at organizing things? Number eight, are your personal finances in order? Number nine, are you passionate about your business idea? And number 10, are you willing to work long hours with no compensation? If you answered yes to eight or more of these questions, you have what it takes to become a CEO. And to learn more, pick up a copy of Harold LaFall's book, Brother CEO, or you can call him at 702-645-8297. And for more advice on achieving your business goals, visit our website as well, makingittv.com. And coming up next, Sandy and David Delgadillo didn't know a thing about exercise equipment, but that didn't stop them from seizing an opportunity to develop a business in the heart of it. Their story when we come back. Celebrating the entrepreneurial spirit in America, Making It is being brought to you by Southern California Edison. For over 100 years, life powered by Edison. And by Honda, the power of dreams. Like Thomas Edison said, opportunity is missed by most people because it comes dressed in overalls and it looks like work. Yeah. But entrepreneurs aren't most people. And today we're meeting business owners who look past appearances to seize an opportunity. Sandy Delgadillo was working in the banking industry when she met two men who would change her life. The first was her husband, David. The second was a business owner. This entrepreneur would eventually tell her of his plan to get rid of a business selling exercise equipment. Sandy and David took a closer look at the company. They saw a business that needed a lot of work, but they also saw something else, opportunity. And when they were visiting the company, the phones were ringing off the hook. And that's when Sandy decided to make the leap from employee to entrepreneur. Today, they've grown Nelly's exercise equipment into a multi-million dollar venture. They put in long hours. They sacrificed precious time with their kids, but they never looked back. Sandy and David Delgadillo 
have seven locations worth millions. They spare no expense in showcasing their equipment for customers. I'd say close to about $70,000, 70 to about $100,000 worth of equipment. So people can come to our stores and try everything that we have to offer for them. Treadmills, ellipticals, home gyms. Sandy was comfortable in her position as assistant vice president of her bank when a customer presented her with an opportunity. I was working for a bank and uh, I came across a client. His name was Mr. Ray Kingsbury, who was the owner of Nelly's Exercise Equipment. He owned one store in the city of San Gabriel and that's where I was working. And he really liked the fact that I was very outgoing and thought that maybe this opportunity would be perfect for my husband and I. Upon visiting the location, Sandy and her husband were a little skeptical. Of course, everybody in the United States is conscious of their health. However, the store was very, very small, and the way he had kept it, it just looked like it was a run-down business. So, um, frankly speaking, we both looked at each other and decided that, no, this isn't probably the right way to go. But it was Sandy's husband, David, who convinced her that Nellie's was a diamond in the rough. I, I tried to look through all the aesthetics of, of the business and I looked at the opportunity based on when I was a young man I think every generation as you're growing up wants to lift weights or they want to do some type of bodybuilding. After examining the competition David became even more encouraged. I thought that a business like ours if we purchased that place would would do well if we took went in there did a facelift on the on the business uh, you know put carpeting did a lot of nice things to it because the person that we went to visit had, at the time, uh, seven locations already. Sandy soon discovered that experience as a banker would serve her well in her new endeavor. Finding different avenues to get lines of credits with banks. If you have good credit, you can just about get an unsecured line of credit anywhere. And big banks such as Bank of America, Wells Fargo Bank are very open to helping small people like ourselves. David's employment background complimented Sandy's knowledge in finance. My background at the time was I was a uh, plant manager for 17 years and indirectly working for me I had uh, somewhere around 350 people that had that worked under me. Even with over 30 years of combined experience it still wasn't enough to prepare them for all the challenges they'd soon face. We sacrificed and gave up our, our beautiful home and leased it out and moved into a condominium. Also, like David said, we gave up our luxurious car. We just had a small, at the time, I think it was a Nissan 240SX that we drove. And my poor husband would drive his 10-speed bike also because he wanted to get fit again and, and go to work. And during those difficult times, it was the strength of family that helped them to persevere. Some of the key figures have been, uh, without a doubt, my wife is the key figure for uh, myself. Uh, my son, uh, I have a son by the name of Brian that has helped me and he's been in the store since he was, I think, 10 years old. And he's 22 now, 23, and he's been a big key to helping us mm -hmm. uh, succeed. All the years of sacrifice have paid off in dividends. From the time we opened, it's, there's not, they've gone from, I think we were doing maybe uh, 50,000 to 60,000 a year, and they're probably close to 4 million a year now. The robust expansion has left the Delgadillos hopeful for the future. Well, we'd like to obviously grow this business for our children. You know, the whole intent was to grow this business so they can have an opportunity since they've put so much effort since they've been born and raised with this business with us. My son now is 10 years old. He was practically brought up with us here. The next step for David and Sandy is to merge onto the information superhighway. A future growth we, we intend on really uh, trying to develop our, our uh, internet business at the time because uh, in conjunction with what we're doing now, that's going to be a big part of our business. David cautions entrepreneurs to be prudent in growing their businesses. Because there's a lot involved in it. There's advertising. There's being able to floor everything because it's, it's a substantial uh, investment to be, put everything. You have signs. You have uh, all the interior that has to be done. you got to floor several thousands of dollars of product that just sits on your floor and is... Uh, you got advertising to consider. So there's a lot of things that go into planning a place in a, a retail store.
Spending their days together as a couple has its challenges, but the husband and wife team routinely work out the kinks. However, I do sign all the checks, but he is the boss, and, um, and we're blessed. And I'm just grateful for, for everything that God's given us. It amazes me how many of the entrepreneurs say that family is something that you don't have a lot of time for once you start the business, right. but family is the very thing that gets you through sometimes. Exactly. And that little guy, her son was uh, in there yeah, he lifting was. weights. <laughs> He's right there with the family business, Take isn't some he? Lessons from, <laughs> yeah. An important business lesson from David and Sandy is never sell products that customers don't need just to make a profit. Okay, coming up next, she's helping women make money and make a difference. Christine Closer is in the studio to share how she empowers women to seize opportunities in their financial and business lives. But first, check out a useful guide that reveals the specifics of how to buy and sell a business. And here's how you can get in touch with the entrepreneurs you've been on today's show. You can contact Carmen Murray of Rodeo Carpet Mills by logging on to rodeocarpet.com. And you can find Sandy Delgadillo of Nelly's Exercise Equipment at nellies.com. Now, here's Lynette Romero with today's studio guest, Christine Closer. Thanks, Emmett. Christine Closer is the founder and executive director of the Network for Empowering Women. She offers a variety of tools to help women take advantage of opportunities and start or expand their businesses. Thanks for being here. We welcome you to making it today. Thank you so much for having me. So we've seen three people today who have acquired businesses. Tell us about the kind of person who does that. Well, first of all, the type of person who does that has got to be someone who's confident in their abilities and also a person who's willing to take risk and knows that the possibility of failure exists and that they're willing to also fail to have the success. You have to be realistic. Yes, and you've got to believe that you can do it. And know that there are going to be problems. We've also seen some of those people who had a lot of problems with other employees in the businesses that they acquired. Absolutely. What advice would you give to them about that? I think the primary thing is to make sure that the new person coming into a business like that really listens to what's going on. Oftentimes when people are causing trouble or making a ruckus or they're just not getting along with everybody else, mm -hmm. it's because they want to be heard. They want to feel like what they have to say is important, that they're being listened to and that their ideas are being taken into consideration. Now let's so, talk about the, the differences between acquiring a business and starting your business from scratch. Which is better? I, I guess there, you know, it just depends. But tell us about the pros and cons yeah, of both. Yeah, it just depends. Um, one of the things about starting your own business is you don't have any history. You don't have any financial history to go by. You don't have any experience of what's really going to work, what's not going to work, what your audience, you know, your target market is going to respond to. On the other hand, if you're taking over an existing business, you do have that history. Mm -hmm. So you know the financials. You know where the pitfalls are going to be. You know what some of the obstacles are going to be ahead of time. You don't have to wait six months to start something new to say, oh, this isn't working. Right. You know what's not working, so you can get in there and really tackle it from the get-go. Now, how do you find out that there's a business out there that is just waiting to be taken over? <laughs> well, I would say probably one of the biggest things is simply to network and talk to people. I mean, we've all heard about six degrees of separation, and typically if someone's looking for an opportunity, it's only as far as the people that they can talk to and the people that they know. There are some publications, and you can search on a website for you know, businesses for sale, but I would say the best way is just talking it up, networking, letting everyone know that you're interested in types of opportunities you're looking for. Tell us a little bit about your organization and what it has to offer for people who are looking for a business or looking to uh, overtake a business. Well, it offers primarily right now women support not only in bi their business life but also their personal, financial, and spiritual lives because you've got to be well-rounded to be able to be successful in business. We have meetings that we offer both virtually and live here in Southern California. We offer seminars, educational programs, audio programs, and you know, just a place for women to connect. Mm -hmm and meet each other. They could network online and find great resources and the people that they need to turn their dreams into reality. As I hold up your book, it's Inspiration to Realization. Yes. As I hold up your book, let's talk about what one of our entrepreneurs said today. She said, um, you know, I, I kept thinking to myself, why me, why me? And we were saying, we should start thinking, why not me? And I can do this. Exactly. And we have to demand and expect more for ourselves. Can you talk about that with women? Is that just something that's 
um, just women are like that or <laughs> is that a gender thing? Um, it may be a gender thing. I think we hear it more from women. I don't think you're as, hear, as likely to hear a man saying, oh, you know, I don't deserve this. This is too much for me. Or, you know, why should all these great things happen to me? I think we're just more likely to hear that with women, which is part of the reason why I pulled this book together with 40 of the women who are members of my organization. Because mm -hmm. women need to hear about other women's success mm -hmm. and be able to feel like, I can have that too. Mm -hmm. I can absolutely have that too. What would you say are the major hurdles, the differences between men and women when they start their own business? I would say in general, and men, men can be very much about the bottom line, the business, really knowing their numbers, you know, getting out there, not being hesitant to get out and sell and sort of work it. Women, I think, just naturally were more relationship oriented, a little mm -hmm. bit softer, maybe not as quick to get out there and, you know, be as big mm -hmm. as we can be. We want to know that you know, we've got some history behind us and really built up our confidence, then we'll get out there and, you know, shout from the highest mountain. Right. But it takes a little bit of time for us to feel a little bit more confident, I think. Are you seeing some trends with women in business now? Well, more and more businesses are being opened by women. I mean, women's businesses right now are growing at three times the rate of all businesses just here in the U.S. And the numbers really? globally are even larger than that. So you have women who want more freedom, more independence, who want to be able to have a life outside of, you know, working for someone else. Right. And more and more of them are taking the option to either start or take over a business. We want to be our own boss. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Great information. We Thank appreciate you. it. And we'll tell you how to reach Christine Closer right after this break, so stick around. Making It, America's most lauded small business TV show, is being brought to you by The Boeing Company by Sempra Energy, a Fortune 500 energy services company committed to building a diverse supplier base. And by the Disneyland Resort in California, where you can experience a whole new world of magic at every turn. And if you'd like to reach Christine Closer, just send an email to ck at newentrepreneurs.com. And you can purchase a copy of today's show on our website, makingittv.com. And there, you can also tap into a number of business resources. Well, that is our show for this week. I'm Lynette Romero. And I'm Emmett Miller. Thanks for joining us. See you next time, right here on Making It. Take care.